one of the greatest challenges of psychology in the 21st century is to understand the phenomenon of consciousness. What is consciousness? And how is it related to the human physiology? I've been interested in this question for 50 years. I'm a university professor. In fact, vice president for academic affairs at Maharishi International University in America. I was attracted to MIU because of its approach called consciousness-based education. And I'm attracted here to Maharshi University of Information Technology for its approach to consciousness-based education. That's another talk. But this question of consciousness is addressed by these institutions and is an important question for 21st century psychology. A deep and important question like this has to be approached in the most profound way. And I would suggest a three-pronged approach that is called <clears throat> the three Eurekas of knowledge. Have you heard of the three Eurekas of knowledge? The first Eureka is personal experience. Eureka, I have had that experience. I understand through experience. The second Eureka is the validation of knowledge through the recorded experiences of the great saints and sages of history. We find it in the ancient wisdom, and it validates what we know now. The third Eureka is objective validation through scientific methods. If we can understand consciousness through these three different ways, personal experience, validation through ancient wisdom, and modern scientific methods, then we can have confidence in our knowledge about consciousness. <clears throat> personal experience. Some of you are probably wondering, what problem of consciousness? There's waking, dreaming, and sleeping. We experience these three states of consciousness. Our life cycles through these. No big deal. Hold that thought for a minute. Eureka number two, validation through ancient wisdom. I'm going to turn to the Upanishads of the Vedic literature of India for guidance in the ancient wisdom, what the saints and sages of ancient India knew about consciousness. In the Mandukya Upanishad, there's a clear description about states of consciousness. Just like what we know from our experience, Verse 2 of the Mandukya Upanishad describes waking state of consciousness. Verse 3 describes dreaming state. Verse 4 describes the sleeping state. 5 and 6, transitional. And then, verse 7 drops a bombshell for psych modern psychology to deal with. And here you see the quotation from the Mandukya Upanishad. The peaceful, the blissful, the undivided, thought to be the, the fourth state of consciousness. That is the self. That is to be known. Let's look at this and see what the Mandukya Upanishad is saying. First, it's talking about a fourth state of consciousness. Right after speaking about waking, dreaming, and sleeping. So this is not just some ephemeral experience of consciousness. This is a state of consciousness worthy of notation as much as waking, dreaming, and sleeping. But its characteristics are of peace, 
of silence, of the undivided, non-dual nature. What does undivided, what does non-dual mean? Non-duality of what? No duality of subject and object. No duality of knower and known. It is a unified experience of consciousness. It is an experience of consciousness awake to itself. Now, <clears throat> it is peaceful, it is blissful, it is silent. It is the self. It is nothing outside the individual. It is not consciousness of an objective experience. It is consciousness, our self awake to oneself alone. <clears throat> How could one, this raises two obvious questions. How can one experience this fourth state of consciousness? And why should it be known? What is so important about this experience of consciousness? Let's talk about the how part first. <clears throat> This experience of the fourth state, as we saw, was peaceful, blissful, silent. <clears throat> it's an experience that is clearly in contrast to the activity of thought and perception on the surface of the mind. To help us understand the position of this fourth state of consciousness in relation to what we know of waking state, I'm going to draw upon a conceptual model that was worked out by Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, who's widely known around the world for having taught the transcendental meditation technique for a period of some 60 years until his passing in 2008. Maharishi was a great scientist of consciousness and he clarified many understandings about consciousness. He was, he attributes this knowledge to that of his teacher, Brahmananda Saraswati, the Shankaracharya of Jyotirmat in the Himalayas during the 1940s and 50s, who was himself an embodiment of the tradition of Vedic masters. Maharishi's explanation for this fourth state of consciousness is to say that <clears throat> it is transcendental to experience. Waking state of experience, thoughts and perceptions in a very active mode. The mind has subtler states of activity and subtler states of activity and subtlest states. And as you see in the diagram, thought is an impulse of consciousness that emerges from pure consciousness and forms and develops to the point where it's experienced as concrete thought and perception on the surface level of the mind. So thoughts arise from within that state of pure awareness and the way to experience that inner silence is to transcend thought from the more gross or superficial, more concrete levels of experience to subtler, more abstract, more abstract uh, levels of thought. And transcending even the subtlest, the faintest impulse of thought is that field of pure consciousness transcendental to experience. <clears throat> that is the fourth state. That is the peaceful, the uh, silent, the 
that be, uh, silent, quality, undivided consciousness awake to itself. So that answers the question of how it can be experienced. One has to learn a technique by which the mind can transcend its own activity. That technique is Maharshi's transcendental meditation technique. I say Maharshi's because <coughs> it is he who formulated the understanding about the mechanics of the technique and taught it widely. The experience is innate to the human being. There have been great saints and sages throughout history who have had experiences of this fourth state of consciousness, which is why the Mandukya Upanishad records the experience. But it's in this modern world that Maharshi systematized it. Now the second question was, why would the Mandukya Upanishad say that is to be known, that should be known? What is so important about this experience? To answer that part, we look carefully at the last word in the expression from the Mandukya Upanishad. And you'll remember it said, that is the self, that is to be known. The word to be known is vigyeha in Sanskrit. Vigyeha is a grammatical form of the word vigyan, which means science. So savigyeha, that should be known, means it should be known scientifically. It should be known through both intellectual understanding and direct experience. That is what the Upanishad is saying. This must be experienced directly. But it's a scientific knowledge. Maharshi himself valued science greatly. And it was in the 1960s that he suggested to a young scholar at you know, the University of California at Los Angeles, that he should study the physiology of the fourth state of consciousness by looking at what happens when people practice the transcendental meditation technique. When they have those moments of inner silence, inner peace, of being awake to oneself, what is happening in the body? So his doctoral dissertation studied the physiology of that experience. And he found blood chemistry was different, skin resistance was different, the uh, EEG patterns in the brain were different. Almost everything that he looked at showed a different quality of physiology distinct from waking, from dreaming, and from sleeping. <clears throat> and so, his work was published, his doctoral dissertation was published in one of the most prestigious journals uh, in this field, the American Journal of Physiology in September 1971. And you can see an image of his uh, foundational article uh, shown there. It was called a wakeful hypometabolic state. Hypometabolic means low metabolism. It means restfulness. So wakeful with restfulness. This state, the fourth state, is characterized as restful alertness. That study <clears throat> was uh, later elaborated over the next 50 years in hundreds of peer-reviewed research studies that have investigated the effects of the transcendental meditation technique across a wide range of uh, impacts on human life and published in many, many journal articles. A few examples just shown on the slide here. Benefits to mental potential to a person's physical health, 
to social relationships, even to creation of peace, radiating peace from the individual to their environment. The topic that other people have spoken on and much has been written about, more than I can say here. Other than to note, that my experience as a professor and our experiences at the Maharishi universities around the world is that the students benefit greatly from this experience. They have that clarity of mind, freshness and alertness that comes from this experience of inner silence, inner wakefulness, inner peace. <clears throat> so, what we have seen here is a body of research over the past 50 years that validates the benefits to the individual from experiencing this fourth state. The transcendental meditation technique is practiced 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the afternoon. And it, the answer to the question, why is it important, is because it provides a holistic development of consciousness for the individual and holistic benefits to mind, body, behavior, and environment. So, thank you for joining me on this tour of the three Eurekas of knowledge, personal experience, validation from the ancient wisdom, and validation by modern science as it can address one of the most fundamental issues of the 21st century, our understanding of the phenomenon of consciousness. <laughs>